Hello and welcome to Joy in Our Town. I'm Orlina Brazier and so happy you joined us today. With me today is a very special guest, C.J. Farghese. He's with First Orlando Counseling Center. He holds two master degrees in marriage and family therapy. And we're gonna be talking today about a couple of issues that do with youth. And the first topic is gonna be teen dating violence. So I know you're gonna wanna stay tuned and listen to the great information we'll receive from CJ. CJ, so glad to have you here. Oh, so Thank happy to be you here. For coming and sharing with us. I know that you're gonna give us some invaluable information for our parents and for the youth that they can watch and and maybe gain some very good insight today. So would you do me a favor and uh, tell our viewing audience a little bit about yourself and how you got involved with marriage and family therapy? Well, I was um, I was doing uh, software engineering for for ten years. Um, I am a product of uh, domestic violence. Mm. Um, my my dad was an alcoholic. Um, grew up in a physically abusive home, and so um, I know that counseling has really helped me uh, and su be successful in my my life. So. You know, it was an easy transition for me to move into um, getting my master's in, in marriage and family therapy uh, and to do this because I love my job and I love what I do and I love to help families and to deal with life issues. So it was an easy transition for me um, to get away from being in front of the computer all day to <laughs> being in front of people, which I really do enjoy doing that uh, a lot better. Well, how wonderful that you took an issue that happened in your life and you found healing and got yourself set free and now you're out helping others. That is so wonderful and we're just so happy you could take some time off of, I know you're very busy schedule to be here to share with our viewing audience. So our first topic is teen dating violence. So will you share a little bit about what you mean when we say teen dating violence? Well, I say I see a lot of parallels between like um, domestic violence and teen dating violence because mm -hmm. it all comes down to um, power and control in a relationship. When you know either the the boyfriend or the girlfriend um, feels very powerless in in the relationship and is being uh, emotionally, physically, or mentally being abused in any sort of way. Um, then that's considered um, teen dating violence where, you know, when it gets to a point of where it's affecting the relationship and, you know, one person is not being respected as a person, um, then that crosses that line. It's so sad that, that teens would even allow that to come in, but like you said, if that's all they've seen, they probably actually they're familiar with that spirit and kind of go to that um, are there some challenges that teen victims would face if they would leave an abusive relationship yeah once again it's the same as like uh, in a domestic violence case where a lot of times the victim it feels very powerless and they're isolated from their family and friends because part of what the uh, the abuser does is they will isolate them away from their families, mm. isolate them away from their um, friends so that they can have power over them. So in that state, you feel, you know, as a victim, you feel really helpless to ask for help or to make that phone call to even to your best friend or to your parents and say, you know, I'm in a really difficult situation. I feel like this is not a healthy relationship. And so they find it really hard to get out of that situation. It sounds almost like um, there's two people, but both of them are insecure. The person that is dating the violent person mm -hmm. and the other one, because here they feel trapped and they don't know who to go to. Mm -hmm. And they probably are afraid to leave that relationship, I would think. Yeah, well, that's what I find in a lot of my clients is that, you know, the abusers usually very insecure about who they are and they use power to try to feel more secure. And the victim is also insecure in that, mm -hmm. but it's more inward. Um, they feel insecure about you know how they look or how they feel about themselves, things like that. So, um, but they're both insecure in some way. And so, a lot of the work that we do at the counseling center is, 
you know, to figure out what is what's going on inside of them to uh, emotional distress that's causing them to um, act in a certain way or feel a certain way uh, in their uh, relationship with their significant partner. Well, can you give us a little bit of a a scenario of what happens in this, like you know, from the beginning to the end, and how it, it gets blows into this abusiveness. Sure, and usually it starts off very innocent, and you know, a lot of times, um, our clients will come in and say, "Well, I didn't see the red flags. I didn't notice that um, this relationship was going down a dangerous path." Um, so oftentimes, it'll start with you know. Oh, he was he was really a nice guy or she was really so kind and caring and was looking after me and things like that and then he turns into uh, let me check your phone or let me check your emails or who are you calling right now and it you might not notice that like that shift happening so you notice that like um, this person is becoming more and more controlling or more and more jealous um, more and more uh, want control over their t your time and what you're doing, when you're doing it, things like that. So those are things that you know we tell uh, our clients to focus on because over time that then builds up to you know crossing that line of uh, belittling them or hurting them physically in some way. Um, and then obviously that can lead into the victim feeling depressed or, or down or anxious. And um, worst case scenario is a lot of times, unfortunately, uh, victims who are part of um, teen violence issues end up committing suicide. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of that now, huh? Yes, definitely. So is a lot of this um, involved bullying also, where there's a lot of bullying yeah, from it, school? and Definitely, because, um, you know, teens, we're all children once, <laughs> you know. We want to fit in. We want to be a part of, uh, like everybody else, have a boyfriend, have a girlfriend, you know. So that pressure of from others of wanting to fit in, have, to have something that everybody else has, uh, forces us to forces the children or the kids to you know compromise on what they think is like healthy or normal um, in relationship. Wow. So, um, what are some good boundaries and conversations that a parent can have with the child and even if a teen is watching what are some good boundaries that they can look for mm -hmm. um, to know what to not allow into a relationship yeah so we talk a lot about parents uh, talking to their kids about what a healthy relationship looks like and what are uh, safe boundaries uh, to have in a relationship like you know when your children are really small you talk about mm -hmm. like inappropriate touch or you know, things like that so when they get older it's equally important to talk about what is appropriate and healthy relationship look like so that when they see it they can be like oh yeah I remember talking to dad about that or I remember talking to mom about that and this is not okay he, he's not supposed to do that or she's not supposed to be you know not uh, not treat me like this you know they, they are more aware of it because we've had the conversation with them before Wow so um, the boundary that they would set is if somebody is talking to you demeaningly mm -hmm. that isn't okay how would a teen handle that or tell that person this isn't okay for you to talk to me like that yeah, and definitely teaching them to stand up for themselves um, you know, continually be in relationship with the parents. Um, a lot of times the parents find it hard as their teen is changing and growing, becoming an adult to maintain that relationship. Um, so, you know, some of the things that we do at the counseling center is to teach parents how to maintain that relationship as your teen is growing and becoming an adult and being uh, more independent. Uh, in that process so teaching them those healthy boundaries are really important so this isn't just about the teen it's about the parent too sure and involving the whole family to make everything better mm -hmm. um, for a, a community what are steps that we can take to bring more awareness to teen dating violence yeah we we, we do have people that go out from our counseling center and speak at different events uh, churches 
uh, community locations um, to talk about you know the dangers of uh, teen dating violence mm -hmm. what are the warning signs um, what are what parents should be doing to get more involved in their children's lives um, things like that do you think a lot of this happens too because um, teens are already in a violent situation at home maybe with the, like you said you were brought up with the father that drank and probably had some major issues correct yeah violent issues sure and um, I think that that's part of the issue because if you grow up in an environment that uh, that was normal to you so then when you end up in that situation again you find that well is this normal or is this not okay like you're not sure about it so the likelihood of you protecting yourself is a lot different if if you, if you grew up in an environment where it was very positive, you had a loving relationships with your parents, parents and things like that, when you uh, end up in a relationship again, what you will see is that, well, this is what normal relationship looks like. It's supposed to be healthy and good. And so anything that takes away from that, you'll notice it, you know. So that's, that's, that, that is a part of it. Um, and, you know, in our society now, domestic violence and things like that are at a rampage, so that makes it a lot more difficult for teens to navigate um, relationships. Yes, and with all the different kind of commercials out there, that probably doesn't help either, and, and magazine articles that make girls feel like they have to look a certain way, and mm -hmm. I'm sure that has a big detriment too on yeah. people. Yeah, well, our, our self-image yes. uh, about who we are, and. What our, what our values are, you know, and um, that's another conversation to have with our kids is about the types of values that we have, the core values that we have, and how do we communicate that to our kids in a healthy way so that they take that on to, uh, as their own values. Uh, Great. So the important thing that we want to leave um, our viewing audience with on teen dating violence, can you give us like what to look for? Like, do you have like one, two, three steps or yeah. something? <laughs> and then we'll go on to the next segment. Sure. Um, main things to look for is the changes in their behavior. Um, oftentimes I tell parents that you will notice that your child's behavior towards their friends and to your family will change they will become more isolated. They will, you know, seclude themselves more. So if they're in an abusive relationship, uh, they're less likely to, you know, keep everything the same way because their abuser will require them to pull away and isolate themselves. So that is, that is number one, that you pay attention to that. Secondly is to get involved, you know, mm -hmm. you have to get involved. With your Jeez, children's with your children. friends and who they're seeing. Yeah, and like, you know, we make it a point, we even with our kids, like, you know, everybody comes over our house, you know, and mm -hmm. hangs out at our place, <laughs> you know. And those things are important because you want to get to know who your fr kids are hanging out with, uh, who are their friends, who is their boyfriend, who is their girlfriend, um, things like that so that you are continually stay involved in the I, I, with them. The third thing is to have those hard conversations. Nobody wants to have the hard conversations about, hey, these things happen in the world. And there are some people that are in a, in, because their own issues uh, struggle with different things. And mm -hmm. so uh, we need to have those hard conversations. Wow. Well, thank you so much, CJ, for sharing about this. And I know this has helped you. And we're coming back to talk about the effects of pornography on our children. And so we'll run to a 30-second PSA. We'll be right back. here when you're ready. Welcome back to Joy in Our Town. I'm Orlina 
Frazier hosting today with C.J. Farkis, who's with the First Orlando Counseling Center just down the street from us. And he holds two master degrees in marriage and family therapy and works there. Um, we're talking now about the effects of pornography on children. And this has been in the local and national headlines. Uh, pornography has been a concern issue when it comes to our children. Could you give us a current reality of this situation? Yeah, well, nowadays, you know, children have access to media and to access to technology since they're born. Mm. I mean, we see parents hand over their, their iPhones <laughs> and their, their, their tablets over to their kids all the time. Mm -hmm. So their introduction to technology is at such a young age. And so the, the, they get exposed at a young age, too. Um, they're saying that uh, some are, as early as 11 years old are being exposed to pornography in, 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 in the U U.S. So, and, and they say that about 47% of children who are in schools, uh, school-age children, get spam of pornography. Wow. So that's, I mean, half our kids essentially get access to some type of pornography uh, on a regular basis, on a daily basis, they say. My goodness, so how is this affecting them? Well, early exposure, um, what we find is that it really changes the child's perspective on sex, it changes their perspective on their body, it changes their perspective on relationship. Mm. So all big those time. things are big factors in, you know, uh, Help, how, how can they process at that young age? Because they're so immature to handle that, that information. So just like you wouldn't have a deep conversation about something with, their, with your kids at a young age before they can handle it, pornography is way above their maturity level to be able to handle and process um, what, that, what that is about. So they will, they will, you know, have body issues, you know, they will mm. struggle with relationship issues um, as a result of that. And also the bigger issue is that it can lead into addictions because mm. it starts off as curiosity, innocence, and, you know, then it, they grow into their teenage years and then it becomes about, you know, um, it becomes a regular pattern in their life and then it becomes, it can become an addiction in their life. So that's why we need to be very careful. And it's very dangerous because you said 47% of school-aged children receive this. I almost think it's probably a little higher than that. Well, that's the reported numbers. Right. Well, <laughs> so, yeah. so I'm sure that it's, it's, it's higher than that um, when we look at actual numbers. Um, so, but, I mean, even in that, we see that it's, it's such a prevalent thing in our society now. And um, a lot of a lot of the parents don't know how to ha manage their technology. That's another problem. Um, so yes. kids go online and they they type in some word, and before you know it, you know they're on a site or they're in a place that they didn't intend to be at at all. And these pornographic sites, what they do is they'll buy up uh, innocent websites um, that mm. that seem very you know. Pony Princess, and you know, you type in PonyPrincess.com, and it could take you to a, um, a uh, to a pornographic website. So uh, they are catering and trying to. Uh, it reminds me of the um, tobacco industry. You know, mm. when they when when they originally targeted toward children and things like that, because they know that if we can get them hooked at a young age, then as they become adults, they will you know become addicted and. Um, buy their product, which is their, what they're selling is pornography. My goodness, and here our precious kids are getting addicted at a young age, and, it's, and they're not even happy with it. It causes them all kinds of moral problems and issues, and, and even, I believe, self-esteem issues, don't you think? Sure. Um, body image is a huge thing, mm -hmm. because um, they start to look at, you know, these images, and they start to look at themselves and think, well, what, what is wrong with me? Or, you know, am I, do I look beautiful enough? Or do I look good enough? And uh, it's about, it becomes very superficial uh, about body parts rather than about the person. 
you know, and in, we try to, you know, communicate to our parents how it's important to, you know, teach our kids about who they are valuable as people. Mm -hmm. And so pornography uh, makes it about um, body parts, like, you know, big, small, you know, tall, yeah, short, you know, things like that. So it really takes the kids away from what's more important. So how can um, we as parents, we as a community work together to help this not to be such a problem? How can we help curve this to out of this 47% that's been reported, mm -hmm. which could be higher? How, do, how What can we do? Well, I think we need to deal with our own guilt and shame about this subject, you know, because this is not a fun topic to talk no. talk about, you know, but, you know, so but being, it's a realistic, it's one. a realistic, <laughs> one. Yeah. yeah, so, but, so we, when we need to deal with our own guilt and shame about this topic and know that it's a reality of the world that we live in, so we need to um, have those conversations in our communities, amongst our, our, ourselves, and I tell parents, they need to be on the same page about these things. Because a lot of times it's like, oh, you know, dad or mom thinks it's not a big deal, and then one person thinks it is a huge deal. So that kind of affects how we deal with the problem in our own homes or in our community. Because we need to get on the same page that this is like a drug. You can't introduce it to children at a young age when they are not able to handle it. So just like we deal with drugs, we try to protect our kids as long as possible so that they're not exposed to something that they cannot handle. We need to do the same um, with this. But with technology, that is the issue. So how can parents help probably maybe by not getting them a phone too young? Sure. And isn't there different things that they can put blockers on phones and on internet yeah. uh, if you have a computer at home? Um, tell us a little bit about that. What, what, what you, mm -hmm. you know, how you work with parents to help this. Sure. I think that, um, well, there's a couple of different things that we need to keep in mind. One is obviously filtering um, because we need to filter our internet access coming into our house so that uh, everything's open. You can type anything and the, the, your children can find it. So it's really important that we have filters in place that will block inappropriate uh, material. Um, and the other thing that oftentimes parents don't think about is technology is walking into your home your house mm -hmm. like their friend has a phone from their mom or their dad or a tablet or things like that that you might not think about uh, filtering because they have their own you know they have access to uh, through the phone that to access that you didn't know that that was there so there are things that you might not think about hey you know what hey let's put all the technology in one place for example um, or moving the computer away from the bedroom into the living room yes. um, so that uh, anybody can see what anybody, you're doing. Yes, and, and so things on. like that is like, you know, or having a time when you can check in all your technology. At 8 o'clock, before you go to sleep, all the technology goes in the living room. So <laughs> those are, you know, uh, Very small good. things that you can do to uh, keep monitoring and protect your kids away from the dangers that are out, uh, out there with uh, pornography. Mm -hmm. And it's also would help adults maybe that have, you know, some issues with this. Mm -hmm. You know, if you make it an open, you know, family thing, people will be more cautious and careful not to do anything sure. foolish. Sure. Um, also, do you think taking phones away from kids at night and putting them away mm -hmm. in the parents' room or something where they don't know about, yeah, uh, it just would help. It seems like. Yeah, we we what what do we do in our our, our home would be to, you know, um, or or I tell my parents that a clients that I see is that, you know, have the charger in the kitchen, mm -hmm. or you know, in the living room, so that you don't have a choice. The kids, mm -hmm. you know, hey, before you go to bed, you plug your phone in, and it's it's in that place. So they're not sleeping with their phones. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not yeah, keeping their phones in their rooms, and they're not, you know, 
it, you know, looking at inappropriate things, and you don't, you, you can't, so their kids will find loopholes in the system. <laughs> you know, they're smart, a lot <laughs> of times smarter than us. <laughs> <laughs> they know how to get through the little things that we even think are blocked, right? Yeah, so because of that, it's really important that, hey, we control what we can control, which is, hey, if I can see it, then I can manage it. But if I can't see it, if they walk off with it into their rooms, uh, or you know, friends come into the house with it, and we don't know how, we don't know what's going on with that, then that becomes very difficult. And then when they're at school, there's a trust issue too. But I, I don't know. I don't think kids really should have phones at school. But yeah. um, I don't. Do you, you guys have a school there in yeah. Orlando first? So. They, I'm sure, don't allow phones, do they? No, they, they, they don't. I think they have to leave it somewhere. Um, and But I think nowadays it's, it's such an unavoidable piece of being in society nowadays, you know? Mm -hmm. So anyway, but this has been very good. And um, your major, give us in just one minute what you want to, what you would say to a parent and to a child about this. I think um, we need to take seriously the the damaging effect of pornography on on the child and on the child's brain. Um, we know that early exposure to pornography will uh, lead the child to possibly have some type of addiction in the future and have a lot of self-image issues and um, body image issues um, as they grow up. And as parents, we need to realize that just like we would guard them from drugs or weapons, uh, or we need to take this subject really seriously and say this is, this is uh, a big deal and we need to protect our kids from it. Wow, thank you so much, CJ. You're I welcome. really appreciate you I appreciate coming you having me. and sharing and for you helping so many families to get their act together and, and become aware of these issues. And I'm glad that um, you can go out and speak to places and schools and whatnot to help people. But we really thank you for taking your time and coming and sharing because it's so important. And for you parents and for you youth out there, we love you and we are so happy you've tuned in and there's help out there. And just, you know, go to your website, check on them and remember that we want you to always go out and have joy in your town. Be safe, have a good week, and we'll see you next time. Bless you. Bye-bye. This program has been sponsored by the Trinity Broadcasting Network and is made possible by your telethon dollars. Your continual support can keep joy in our town coming to your home every week. Write to Joy in Our Town. Post Office Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711.